Um, my name is Dylan LeClaire. Um, I'm with the legendary Adam Back. Uh, we're going to be talking about some Bitcoin derivatives, pretty broad topic, but we'll, we'll try to keep it simple to start and then we'll maybe um, kick it off a little bit from there. Um, I don't think we need to do intros. Um, Adam, you want to tell, tell people about yourself? <laughs> um, but yeah, so let's, let's start from the basics. What are, hello, uh, what are Bitcoin derivatives um, for, the, for the layman, Adam? So I think it, it covers a, a number of financial activities that somebody might do on a trading platform like a crypto exchange or a stock exchange. Um, so the most obvious, which is not a derivative, is, which is you just buy a share or a Bitcoin. In a Bitcoin case, you take it off the exchange and you cold store it. But there are other kind of more exotic types of things you can do. Uh, one is to add leverage, so you can borrow money to buy Bitcoin, and sometimes people use Bitcoin itself as the collateral for the borrowing. And so that is like margin trading, and there is another form of that, which is uh, the, the so-called perpetual future, which is, I think, relatively rare outside of the crypto space, but quite heavily used in the Bitcoin trading market. And of course, it adds a lot of risk. It's kind of like you know somebody doing real estate investment buying apartments to rent out with 90% mortgages and then you know they have an impressive amount of uh, property a notional high net worth and the property price falls 10% and now they have nothing they're bankrupt so that's the kind of risk profile and then also encompassed within derivatives are you know uh, futures with an expiry date and um, options as well so like to, si to simplify it we had we had um, traditional futures markets that had monthly expirations or quarterly expirations, right? So I can sell oil for some, you know, in March of 2025 for, for a price. Um, but Arthur Hayes from BitMEX created the first perpetual swap, correct? Where this... Oh, I'm a little loud. <laughs> check, check. Um, sorry about that. Um, Perpetual swaps. Um, so there's often a lot of narratives um, in Bitcoin. Often in bull markets, you hear one side. Bear markets, you hear the other. That this leverage, these futures markets, these esoteric derivatives are good, are bad, are pumping the price. They're suppressing the price. How do we navigate all this noise? Is it good at all? What are your thoughts broadly on the topic of discussion? And a second part question is... Is Bitcoin at risk of, say, a gold type of suppression scheme? Um, I think it's much harder for, to suppress the Bitcoin price. Like the volatility makes that dangerous to to short. Um, and I think, um, you know, some people worry about so-called paper Bitcoin uh, because in the gold market there is actually such a thing as paper gold, which is. There are gold ETFs, and it turns out that some of the gold ETFs don't actually have that much gold. They bought other things, like they bought gold, like stocks of gold mining companies or derivative products, and or they were relending the gold, so it's kind of rehypothecated. And so, for people buying gold ETFs, they pay attention to know whether this ETF is physically backed. But with Bitcoin, it's uh, much more obvious because you withdraw your coins, and if you don't get the coins, you get very upset, right? So. Um, now, the perpetual futures are like a side contract. So, you know, what, for every person that is buying uh, the perpetual future contract, there has to be a seller. So somebody is long, like they're expecting the price to go up, and somebody is short, they're expecting the price to go down. And so, and you know, obviously they need the, the price of the perpetual future to match the price of Bitcoin, it has to track, right? It's a side contract, so if you're not careful, it, it could diverge. And so it turns out that there are much more, you know, many more people who want to bet the Bitcoin will go up than who want to bet it will go down in the long term. And so now the problem for the petrol future contracts is where do you find the sellers? And so what the perpetual future contract does is it pays an interest rate to anybody who is short and like a pretty high one, you know, 10, 20%, maybe more in a, in a bull market. And that, that rate is changing all the time. And so what it does is it allows somebody to sort of be synthetically short. So how I'd go synthetically short is I take 
$27,000 in US dollar in a stable coin or in cash, and I want to collect the interest rate on it. So I buy a physical Bitcoin, so that's I, I bought it on a spot market, and then I use it as collateral, and I go short one Bitcoin. And so then I'm going to get paid the funding rate, which comes from the people who are, you know, making leverage bets that Bitcoin will, price will go up, and I collect the interest. And so, you know, I'd say that is completely neutral because while it enabled somebody to buy one paper Bitcoin, for each paper Bitcoin that I enabled, I bought a physical Bitcoin. So that's sort of neutral, right? There's no new sort of uh, possibility for people to buy Bitcoin who, do, who aren't really having Bitcoin. It's just indirect, right? They bought a perpetual... I bought a physical and then shorted it to enable them to buy the petrol. So I think that's largely neutral. And the other type of buying is margin buying. So there, obviously, people are borrowing money to buy Bitcoin and they're buying spot. So actually, I think that there is you know, more net margin long than there is paper Bitcoin in the system. So, so, so to simplify this, essentially we have... Uh, there's a spot market price and you know, there's, a, there's, there's not one Bitcoin price. There's, you know hundreds of exchanges around the world, some obviously l much larger than others. And then a lot of these, these large um, spot market players have derivative contracts offered on their platform. And so what, what keeps this, as you were saying, what keeps this price of a, of a futures contract, a perpetual one that never expires, you know, tethered or, or around, hovering around the spot market rate is a variable interest rate, right? And as you were saying, in a bull market, people were paying 50, 60 percent annualized rates to long Bitcoin. And now, you know, post FTX collapse, you saw people were getting paid to go long Bitcoin. So essentially, like, say I have a stable coin, I have cash, and I long, I long Bitcoin 1x instead of just buying, say, like, let's, I 1x long one spot, uh, one Bitcoin. Then essentially, I'm getting paid an interest rate to go long. I'm pay, getting paid an interest rate to hold yeah. the spot Bitcoin position. I mean, that, that tends to be, that has happened for a few periods but it tends to be short-lived and it's in the sort of bottom of a bear market where people are getting nervous it will fall further. Generally, the perpetuals are charging you an interest rate. Um, and the interest rates are different. You know, it just depends on the exchange. And it's a market set interest rate. So there's nobody setting the interest rate typically. It's just... That's you the know, key, right? This yeah. system doesn't work with centrally planned rates. Yeah, this is a true market rate. And interestingly, it's running around 20%. So... Maybe that makes sense because, you know, what's the actual real inflation rate? So. Yeah. Okay. So we have this, um, maybe this is a little bit of a, a tangent, um, but we have this centralized derivative complex um, and we've seen some catastrophic failures, obviously, um, fraudulent activity with the, you know, the FTX style um, blow ups. Um, and, and, you know, certainly it comes out after the fact that FTX was selling their customers Bitcoin. Um, who knows what they were doing, you know, with their cross-margin futures platform. Um, but there is this kind of, th there's been a long um, kind of opportunity uh, or something that people have been chasing in the developer community of creating sort of, you know, a market that's not a centralized custody solution. And with Bitcoin, it's, it's really never been possible. There's always been kind of trust assumptions. And we, you know, we're still there at this point. Um, but there's all sorts of people trying to build derivative um, opportunities on the Lightning Network, um, there, you know, or, or, you know, derivative kind of uh, DLC contracts with, say, options or stablecoin swaps. And just recently, about three or four days ago, we have a conceptual virtual machine um, on Bitcoin. And it's, you know, there's only a few things have been tested out, but in theory, this opens up a whole bunch of doors um, of trustless or trust, extremely trust-minimized Bitcoin derivative um, solutions, and in, and in my opinion, that's a massive, massive um, opportunity, especially because it opens up, like you said earlier, if you're short Bitcoin with Bitcoin collateral, 1x, that's a synthetic dollar. And so that's, this is, you know, everybody talks about algo stables, this is why we had an $80 billion Ponzi called Luna, was come, it was because someone thought they, you know, with a perpetual motion machine, built a synthetic stablecoin. Um, but, you know, if, if we can build something like this in a decentralized way where you don't have to trust, a, you know, um, a Binance or, or a centralized solution, what, what, and, and obviously, like, this is hypothetical at this point, but what are your thoughts on maybe 
just the, the practicality of such a thing, even though we are talking in hypotheticals, and also, you know, um, I guess just your overall thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think there are a few ways to sort of create a synthetic dollar from different types of derivatives. So one you mentioned is um, being both long and short on uh, perpetuals. So with a Bitcoin collateralized perpetual, use Bitcoin as collateral, so that's one times long, and then you open a one time short contract and you have a pretty stable dollar price and you actually get paid, you know, you get paid the funding rate for doing that, so it gives you an interest rate. Um, another way is with options, so there are option strategies where you basically, you know, buy a straddle and then you, you either, as, as you make money from one or the other uh, getting exercised, you buy another one and that will cost you a certain amount per year to maintain. So I think the option one won't pay you, you'll have to pay to maintain it, so maybe not as attractive. But there are um, you know, different ways to have trustless contracts and in, in a way the fact that almost all of the trading volume in the Bitcoin ecosystem is on custodial exchanges is kind of disappointing because one of the you know, beauties of the Bitcoin blockchain is that you don't have to trust people and you've got like this sort of uh, uh, self-contained smart contract mechanisms. So, you know, there are different Bitcoin layer two systems. So you talked about uh, some DLCs and some lightning contracts that can try to sort of fix a stable value in dollars, even though they're Bitcoin collateralized. And there's another Bitcoin layer two, which is liquid, and that has support for other assets. So it enables you to use Bitcoin-like contracting on stable coins and Bitcoin. So you can build up a Bitcoin dollar like market price and you can have non like central order books that are non custodial which I think is quite interesting so people can um, you know create a contract on their hardware wallet to say well if Bitcoin reaches this price I'll buy some more and the stable coins are in your wallet if the orders if the order executes you know the pre-signed transaction will go to the seller and you will get the Bitcoin in your wallet so that's it's my mind how exchanges should work and that same sort of contracting system enables trustless um, options. And the interesting thing about call and put options is you don't need a price feed you know, in price oracle to make them work. The uh, incentives happen to work out. Um, but as you said, you know, it, I think as those building blocks get more liquidity and people can compose things on them, uh, you could perhaps like introduce a synthetic stable coin. There is, there is another sort of stable coin on liquid, which is called uh, Fuji money. And that is, um, it's basically a way to sort of be margin long Bitcoin and like take some of the collateral out. So you do have a liquidation risk, but at least each person that does that has picked their own loan to value ratio and potential liquidation level. If they get liquidated, they keep a stable coin and, and the, the person who provided it keeps the Bitcoin. Um, so there are lots of opportunities and I think it's great you know, to see more decentralized things come into play so that there are less risks of FTX-like failures going forward. Love it. Um, so kind of touching on a point we, I, I briefly asked you about um, at the beginning with like the price suppression, um, I'll steal man um, the argument that we're going to, or, or someone, whether it's the government or some, you know, bear whale or some entity, is going to suppress the price of Bitcoin. Um, so in the U.S., right, there's no spot ETF. Gary Gensler and crew roll out a futures ETF, um, which has a couple billion dollars of AUM. That's tied to CME futures. And the CME futures um, are quarterly. It's not perpetual. Um, but it's backed by treasuries and cash. And so if, like, as collateral. And so if I am, um, you know, if I'm someone that's thinking about, hey, well, how did gold, uh, you know, kind of get um, tied down from the, the banking industry, um, that looks a little bit like that. Um, so what do you say to that? And then also, um, in a future world where maybe this Bitcoin margin style derivative isn't on, or maybe there's crypto casinos still exist, but it's not on the... Uh, FTXs of the world with thousands of shit coins, excuse my French, um, it's on, say, a Fidelity or, um, you know, these, instead of being cross collateralized with the crypto industry, and I'm sure it'll still exist, but we have these Bitcoin 
margin programs, Bitcoin futures, Bitcoin derivative style um, options, contracts, but it's more so in tune with the, uh, the legacy world. Um, so that's a two-part question, but what are your thoughts on, on some of that? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the CME futures have two pans of use. One is people doing uh, sort of cash and carry trades, so they will try to collect the interest implied, and that's, that's uh, you know, Bitcoin neutral, it's just collecting interest on dollars. You will, um, you know, get paid to provide Bitcoin at a higher price later, and then you use that money to buy Bitcoin, and then you deliver it later. If it's dollar settled, it gets sold at whatever the price is at the time. And then the other one is for people who want to buy Bitcoin and lock in today's price, they'll put up some margin. And the, and the, the leverage is quite low on those platforms. I think you have to put 50% margin, right? So you really, you tapped out at two times leverage and you'll get margin called if it falls below that. Um, but that means you can, you know, if you put, if you want to buy a Bitcoin and you think the price will be higher in three months, um, then you can put up, you know, if the price is 27,000, you can put up 13 and a half thousand, you can buy a whole Bitcoin future contract in, and there's an interest rate you're paying. So it's a, for, it's a form of loan to buy Bitcoin. And uh, then at the end of the day, you'll get enough money to buy a whole Bitcoin um, when you, you know, add capital to it later. So you've, you know, you pay off the loan effectively. So I think um, those things are sort of arbitrage to physical Bitcoin. So probably where things go wrong in the um, sort of rehypothecation of gold and stock and what happened with GameStop and things like that is that it's possible in the traditional finance world to sort of uh, sell something you don't have and pay for it later uh, just due to delayed settlement. And so I think with Bitcoin, that's much harder to do because too many of the players are expecting physical Bitcoin and you can't sell, you know, you can't sell a Bitcoin if you don't have it, basically, right? And each of these um, perpetual contracts has a buyer and a seller and they're arbitrage to spot as well. So I think in a Bitcoin world, most of it flows through to spot, which isn't so much the case in, a, in a, like gold ETFs and stock market uh, short players and things like that. So um, if I'm in the audience and I, you know, don't, maybe this is my first intro to derivatives or I've never traded them and, you know, most, you probably should. <laughs> These are uh, designed to, uh, the 100x products are designed to, to part uh, you from your money. Um, but why are we even talking about Bitcoin derivatives in the first place? Why should anybody care? Um, and I would say that um, it's, it's because um, on a longer time frame, and this is my personal opinion, um, and I think this, uh, you align with this as well, Adam, that on a longer time frame, it's net neutral for price action, right? Because, um, and, you know, maybe some short-term, medium-term dislocation, some volatility, but d derivatives on a long time frame, like I can buy spot Bitcoin and I can put it in cold storage or I can time lock it or I can send it to a burn address and it'll never touch the market again. Um, but with a derivative, like if I short or if I long, you have to close that eventually, right? So... Whenever you see, like, say, if you look at the chart of Bitcoin and you see, like, the infamous BART pattern, right? Like, that's usually derivative traders with way too much uh, leverage. Um, and they should probably just visit a casino, right? Um, and so I think, like, in my opinion, the derivative, um, this whole complex, is, is net neutral on a longer time frame. Um, and when you see, you know, massive moves up or down, like 10%, 8% in a day, it's not like everybody just got super interested in buying Bitcoin on a, on a Sunday morning, right? It's just a bunch of people that short sold had to, had to force close if, if price is going up and if price is going down, they're getting margin called and liquidated. Um, so do you align with that, like that it's net neutral? Um, yeah, I mean, I think you see different types of market activity. So there are the people that buy and cold store and they uh, they help obviously because they shrink the amount of coins available to trade um, then there are um, sort of what I call price formation so people who will step in and buy Bitcoin with conviction and hold it for the long term if the price falls very far so these people sort of set the floor and then in between there's a lot of uh, short term speculative stuff and I think a lot of the derivative trading is like that particularly the perpetual futures because it's higher leverage I think there are some people doing margin trading 
and doing it longer term. So they are actually, you know, defending the floor and uh, helping the price formation. But yeah, I think the the uh, the derivative game is sort of adding liquidity, but it's not really directionally, uh, you know, helping the price. Makes sense. Um, we got five minutes here, so maybe we'll. Um, I was asking a bit earlier. This is kind of derivatives, a, a bit similar to kind of the margin stuff. Um, but Bitcoin collateralized loans was a really big um, story of the bull cycle, and you know more so it came out on the other side once we were deep in the bear. That you know a lot of these industry players were very much leveraged, and the miners, um, and you have players like obviously like the Celsius of the world that are using like altcoins as collateral that all go that go bust, gratefully so. Um, but you have you know other players in the industry that are doing it right. Uh, and they're doing, you know, very, very um, secure over collateralized loans, you know, um, segregated in a multi-sig. Uh, for instance, Unchained have no affiliation with them, um, but 100% uh, recovery rate, there's, there's, they've never had a default or a loss in their loan book in five years, hundreds of millions of dollars. And so when you con contrast that to the legacy finance world, right, we have a 24-7, 365 market with liquidity all over the globe. You know, Bitcoin is notoriously volatile, yes. You know, your house is not going to fall 80% or 60% like Bitcoin is. But over collateralization can, can make up for that. So do you see a world where, you know, the kind of the, the legacy guys, the suits, if you will, um, see, this, see these numbers and, and, and are, you know, um, intrigued by this? Or is it still just way too niche, too small, and, you know, they're, they're not, they're not uh, coming? Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting because there is a big dislocation between the interest rates that, I mean, even, even though the, the interest rates are much, much elevated compared to a couple of years ago and the U.S. Treasuries and the Euro and so on, um, it's still low compared to margin funding rates and Bitcoin secured loan rates tend to be in a similar location to margin funding rates, even though they are typically fixed rates. Um, but, you know, they're still well, well into the double digits, you know, 12 percent, 16 percent, it's not unheard of. So really, in a conventional world, if, if a financial institution offered, uh, you know, 15 percent interest, people will be deeply suspicious that it's a scam because it's such a high rate, right? But I think what's going on is that the, the, the conventional finance world is, you know, doesn't, doesn't feel enough confidence in the platforms and in the, in the technology. So it feels very risky to them, so they stay out of it. Even, so even though they're making a lot less on the money, they'll stay out. And then in the Bitcoin world, the, you know, if you are taking a Bitcoin secured loan and it's coming from another user, then you're basically paying them a premium because you're, you're sort of paying them to not buy Bitcoin. And so you know, most, of, most of the people tend to be too all in to have much dollars to lend, or if they do lend, it ends up being at a high rate. So I think that's what's driving it all. But eventually, you know, some of the bigger players in the conventional finance world that are making the step across, like Fidelity and so on, some of those guys will fill in the gap. And you would think eventually those rates should compress so that, you know, the, uh, the general market rate becomes more similar to a mortgage rate in a, in a Bitcoin sector. Like, and, I, and I, I completely agree there, you know, where a secured Bitcoin loan um, for a company that has never seen a default or a loss in their loan book is, you know, eight, nine percent. And it makes sense because they're operating in Bitcoin terms, so they don't want to, they have to, they have to access the capital, capital elsewhere. Um, but in theory, that should be, you know, pushed to Fed funds plus 50, 100 basis points. Well, I mean, they're, they're already helping, right? Because if they are offering sub 10 percent, that's already lower than the margin loan rates. And so some people who would have traded with margin margin loans and paid 15% are now getting 8 or 9% because they put some Bitcoin as collateral and they did it themselves. So I think that, you know, when you have a big dislocation like that, the early adopters and uh, HODL HODL is another example with a similar product, right? It's a two or three escrow yep. multi-sig. Um, people arbitrage it. So they get in the middle, they, they find an external source of capital, um, or they mortgage something that they have that is, you know, fully paid, like some property or something, and then they lend at these at these rates. And each time they do that, they help bring the rates together. So eventually, we'll get there. But for the moment, you know, even 20% is going to mark it in uh, margin trading. Yep, completely agree. You know, the world where Goldman Sachs lets you pledge, 
you know, your Tesla stock for Fed funds plus 50 basis points, but I'm paying, you know, t a thousand basis points on an oversecured, you know, Bitcoin collateralized loan is, is right. a world where I think that's where the, the biggest arbitrage opportunity is. Um, kind of, if you think in, in terms of like the financiers, if you will, um, that haven't touched or, or stepped foot in the Bitcoin world. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. We got about 18 seconds left, so I think that's all we got for today. Um, hope that wasn't too abstract and esoteric, um, and appreciate everyone following along. Welcome back to the Bitcoin Amsterdam Live Desk, brought to you by Bitcoin Magazine. We heard derivatives, we heard ETFs, we heard pledging, collateralization, margin trading. What's going on? What's going on, guys? Lots of heady, lots of complicated financial terms. Charlene, what were your impressions? Listen, this is an exciting time for Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin is moving toward traditional finance. Um, I think this Bitcoin ETF is a, it is a stamp of approval from traditional finance, and it allows grandma to get into Bitcoin. I think that's a good thing. I see this as an opportunity for financial education. We heard earlier, I think Cyril said that it's kind of your first step. You get the Bitcoin ETF, you learn about it, you learn about Bitcoin, and then maybe you decide to hold an actual, hold the actual asset. I think this is great for Bitcoin. It's going to be great for adoption, and it allows the world to step into this Bitcoin ecosystem. It's amazing. Uh, we, we, we see this conversation about derivatives and ETFs, and what used to be seen as sophisticated niche projects that required a Series 7 Wall Street license to even understand, right. and suddenly everyone's talking about it. We're capable of talking about it. That's what Bitcoin has done to the world. You know, for years ago, regular people with regular jobs, they had no idea how the financial system works. It's partly why they got away with what they did back in 2008. A lot of people know now, and the fact that people are sitting around talking about, at this point, derivatives, we talk about the central bank, right? These are things that used to happen in the back rooms, uh, you know, with the smoke and mirrors, and now people actually understand this stuff. And, you know, Bitcoin has really forced Wall Street to accept at this point, right? Wall Street fought this tooth and nail. They did not want Bitcoin in the party. Finally, they've given up and they've accepted reality. And, you know, I, I agree with Charlene. This is a big deal for expanding the lifeboat. You know, there's a lot of people in this world, a lot of pension money where people are locked into it and they cannot cold store that, right? You've got this right. whole regulatory empire that is built to freeze you in. So once we've got people on the inside who are on our side who have, they've got senators on speed dial as well, I think this is a big deal for Bitcoin. And and can I add one thing? I had a conversation with, I was at a conference where I was talking to pension fund allocators and when I told them that BlackRock was in Bitcoin. They sat up straight and they paid attention. And yep. so that is, that's it. You know, sometimes someone else has to lead. The BlackRock ETF is a big deal. And I think that this will be, this will continue. So I see Bitcoiners who are getting ready for whatever D-Day storming a beach in World War III <laughs> looks like World War, sorry, World War II looks like World War III is a economic war and Bitcoiners understand the game. And next we're going to hear what that leads to. We're going to explore crypto sovereignty in the next session, hosted by Tur Demeester. You're going to have some of the best Bitcoiners there talking about financial freedom and freedom in general based on Bitcoin. See you after the break. Thank you, Miami, for the last three years in this amazing city. The whole world shut down, but Miami welcomed us with open arms. We want to show Bitcoin to the whole world. We are taking the conference on the road to set the stage for Bitcoin in a new city. Nashville. Bitcoin 2024 is coming to Nashville in Tennessee. A city that is known as a music and freedom city. Bitcoin 2024 in Nashville from July 25th to 27th. 